The next few videos are going to be on psychiatric disorders, and this video in particular is going to be on mood disorders, disorders of your mood, what elevation of the mood or depression of the mood. The common, the main ones are going to be major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. The one we're going to talk about today is going to be major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder. More commonly just referred to as depression, and depression is depression of the mood. That's why we call it a mood disorder. However, just like any other disorder of any other block, you need a certain diagnostic criteria. Psych is no different. And the diagnostic criteria is you need at least five of the following symptoms. What are these symptoms? You're gonna have changes of your sleep. Commonly insomnia, but you can have increased sleep. So. They've noticed that in depression, patients fall into REM sleep a lot quicker, yeah? If you recall from your sleep, you, you're awake and then you start falling deeper and deeper and deeper into, in the stages of sleep, you'll finally hit this non-REM sleep and then you'll hit REM sleep and that's the deepest stage. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. It sounds good to have increased REM sleep. However, these patients wake up frequently or they wake up early, so they're not really feeling refreshed. I'll say frequent wakings. There's many ways they can say increase REM sleep or getting in the REM sleep quicker. They might say decrease REM latency, which just means decrease the interval of, from being awake to REM sleep. Or they might say decrease slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is just the deepest non-REM sleep. So those are just fancy ways, they just mean the same thing. So changes in your sleep, let's head back to over, over here. Um, loss of interest is a big one, we call that anhedonia. Feelings of guilt is common. Changes in energy, so loss of energy is common. Loss of concentration, they might feel like they're not able to concentrate as well. Changes in appetite, whether decreased or increased, usually decreased. They feel like they're not eating as much, they don't feel hungry. Psychomotor changes. Whether agitation or uh, psychomotor retardation. And the most important suicidal thoughts. Always, always screen anyone with depression or depressed mood for suicidal thoughts. It's incredibly important to not only screen for it, but see at how high risk they are at completing suicide. So do they have access to firearms? Do they have they ever had an attempt before? Have they do they have a structured plan? And also look for factors that might decrease the risk of suicide. So do they have you know really strong family and friend support? Always screen and then always assess the risk because you might have to hospitalize them right then and there. So you need at least five of these with at least one of them being depressed mood. That's just the name of the game. We're talking about major depression here. Or you can have anhedonia. That's how important anhedonia is. Just that loss of what you usually found enjoyable. Now that's the symptoms. There's something also very important in psychiatric disorders and also any disorders. And that is the time frame of these symptoms. Is it acute? Is it chronic? That's very important. That always changes our management of any disorders, and psychiatric is no different. So, time frame is going to play a running role in all our future videos. What's the time frame of this? Major depressive disorders means you need to have at least five of the following symptoms for at least two weeks. At least two weeks. If they don't, they don't meet the criteria. Okay. That's an easy way to trick people on psychiatric disorder questions. Though in the question system, they'll just gloss over. They'll just gloss over the time frame, hoping you forget. Yeah. And if you don't look at the time frame, then you'll get the question wrong. It's just that simple, right? It's just that black and white. So always look at the time frame. It has to be over two weeks. Now, what if you have a milder form of these symptoms that's been going on for a longer time? So over two years. Over two years, we call that dysthymic disorder. That's a milder, more chronic form. So see how time frame plays a role here? While we're talking about these different types of depression, let's just talk about some other ones. So you can have atypical, why do they call it atypical depression? Because instead of things like insomnia, you can have increased sleep, so hypersomnia. Instead of loss of appetite, you can have increased appetite, so hyperphagia. Another classical uh, sign is these patients are at increased 
sensitivity to criticism of themselves. You can imagine if you're already feeling down, you don't want to be criticized. But the dead giveaway is lead in paralysis. What does that mean? Paralysis means you can't move. Lead in, like you, you, feel, you feel like your limbs are made out of lead. Let's talk about how they feel their arms are so heavy or when they're trying to get out of bed, it just feels like their arms are made out of lead. That's lead in paralysis. Very classic of atypical depression. Now, another time you see depressed mood commonly is postpartum, after delivering a baby, sometimes even during pregnancy. Very, very common. So you can have a mild depressed state that doesn't quite meet the criteria for depression, so we just call it postpartum blues. Again, very common. Usually seen and resolves within two weeks. What do you do for it? Well, it doesn't meet the criteria for depression, so you're not gonna give like depressed, depressive pharmaceuticals or anything, you just reassure them tell them that it's very normal and uh, reassess them in two weeks to make sure it goes away. Sometimes it does not go away. Sometimes it progresses into full-blown depression. What do we call that? What do you think we call that? We call that postpartum depression. So that's over two weeks. It has all the signs of depression. Yeah, over two weeks. Over two weeks, depression signs. Uh, and you treat it just like you would depression. So. So therapy, antidepressants, again, very common. Something that's more rare, thankfully, is that some of these women might start hearing things that aren't there, seeing things that aren't there, having psychotic symptoms. We call this postpartum psychosis. This is a medical emergency and you need to hospitalize them right away because they can be a harm to themselves, they can be a harm to the baby. This is those really sad cases of a mother being perfectly normal, having a baby and then you know, undergoing a psychotic uh, attack and drowning the babies in a bathtub or all these horrible things. So hospitalize right away and give antipsychotics. Very serious, hospitalize, antipsychotics. Why do these all appear around the postpartum area, ton of reasons, a ton of theories, maybe from the really rapid changes in hormone, maybe from the stress of having a new baby, the sleep deprivation, all these factors. So postpartum mood disorders, very common. So that was just your subtype of uh, depression. Let's jump back into major depressive disorders. What's the mechanism? Unfortunately for a lot of these psychiatric disorders, the clear mechanism is not well, no, there could be, there can be genetic factors, there can be previous trauma. So all these factors play a role. Another theory is, They've noticed that their people that have depression have decreased things like serotonin and decreased norepinephrine, decreased dopamine. So they think neurotransmitter and the imbalance of neurotransmitters play a role. And not only that, something that supports us if you give drugs that raise these depressive symptoms seem to get better. This is called the monoamine theory. Monoamine theory. Why is it called the monoamine theory? Your amino acids make a ton of things. They make a lot of neurotransmitters. For example, norepi and dopamine are catecholamines. Serotonin is made from another amino acid, tryptophan. All these are monoamines. They have that amine group still attached to it because they're from amino acids. So we call that monoamine theory. And the theory is when you have decreased serotonin, norepi, and decreased dopamine, you can precipitate these depressive symptoms. So what do you think we're gonna do for these patients? We're gonna try and raise these, yeah? And we can do it first and foremost with conservative treatment, so therapy, exercise. Exercise seems to raise dopamine and norepi levels, serotonin levels, it's like a natural, I, I don't wanna say high, because that might not be the right thing to say in a psychiatric block, but it gives them a lot of energy, makes them feel better. So therapy and exercise are common stays and something you should always consider, conservative treatment first. But if that fails, then you want, might wanna move on to pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceuticals, as you can imagine, will target these. Try and raise them up. Before we get into that, let's just go over the mechanism of these neurotransmitters. Exactly how they travel in our body. To say this is norepi, this is serotonin. We have them in our vesicles of our axons. 
and they get released and they'll stimulate a receptor on the other side. That's fine and dandy. Some of it will get taken back up through transporters and an enzyme in the mitochondria called monoamine oxidase. Well, degrade it. Degrade. Degrade. Kind of gets rid of some of that excess neurotransmitter. That's just the usual pathway of these monoamines. So, our drugs need to somehow raise, raise these monoamines. The first line is going to be SSRIs. SSRIs stand for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. What do you think that does? It selectively inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. So it blocks that reuptake pathway. And if you block that reuptake pathway, then you just have more serotonin in the synapse. And that just stimulates more. Helps and is great for helping depressive symptoms. Some side effects you should know. Weight gain is a big one. Serotonin in your gut can cause diarrhea, you know, serotonin syndrome. So diarrhea, and more importantly, it can cause ED. Any drug that causes ED, you need to know, because ED really limits the compliance in male patients. So it causes ED. And last but not least, always know it inhibits your P450 enzymes. Next up on the list are gonna be your tricyclic anti Depressants. These are antidepressants that will also block reuptake. So they'll also block serotonin, but you also add norepi. So this increases also. It's however fallen out of favor. Why is that? It's, I mean, it's blocking both. Why is it falling out of favor? It just has a really bad side effect profile. It's not as specific, and so it can cause anticholinergic effects. That's, you know, that dry mouth, that's a blurry vision, the constipation, urinary retention. You can have heart arrhythmias, that's no good. And it can precipitate delirium, again, no good at all. However, sometimes we can use the side effect profile to our advantage. One of the drugs is Impyramine. Impyramine is a strong anticholinergic that can cause urinary retention. We can use it at a lower dose, use it for bedwetting in kids. Those are TCAs, next up, SNRI. What does SNRI stand for? Serotonin norepi reuptake inhibitor. Take a wild guess what that does. <laughs> blocks serotonin reuptake, blocks norepi reuptake. So the mechanism is very similar to TCA. So serotonin norepi. The good thing about this is a newer drug, a uh, better si uh, side effect profile, so less weight gain. You can actually see increases in sexual drive for those that are worried about ED. Next on our list, MAO inhibitors. Name gives it away again. This blocks MAO, the enzyme that degrades are hard-working monoamines. And by blocking that degradation, you have increased monoamines. So increased monoamines. And this is actually great for atypical, great for atypical depression. You gotta know that. Cold. Can you recall the signs of atypical depression? So pause the video, recall the signs. Hopefully you remember, because we, <laughs> we just went over it five minutes ago. That's uh, hyperphagia, hypersomnia, Lead and paralysis, that's a big one, so feeling like your arms are made out of lead. So what drug would you use for that? Mal inhibitors. That increases your monoamine. Now, is it too much of a good thing? Yes. You can have too much serotonin when you're taking monoamine. So if you're taking monoamine, you're taking something else like SSRI, anything that raises serotonin levels, you can have too much serotonin and you'll have serotonin syndrome. So you'll have the diarrhea, you'll have the flushing. That's no good. We'll call that serotonin syndrome. You have something called too much 
tyramine. What the heck is tyramine? Tyramine is a precursor to norepi. Seen in a lot of things like wine and cheeses. And if you eat those or ingest those substances while you're on Mao, you have way too much norepi. And norepi does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is it causes vasoconstriction. So you can have hypertensive crisis. So there's too much of a good thing going on here. How do we avoid that? Well, after you stop amine, you want at least two weeks where you kind of let it clear out before you take things that increase serotonin like SSRIs or you take things like, <clears throat> or you eat things like tyramine rich foods. Okay? Let's move on to other drugs. Bupropion. Bupropion is a more unique drug. It blocks the reuptake of norepi and dopamine. One of the few drugs we talked about that works on the dopamine pathway. There's a lot of good things about bupropion. No real changes in weight or ED symptoms. It also, work on, it also works on nicotinic receptors. So it can be used as a smoking cessation. That's great. Helps people quit smoking. However, there's always a downside and the downside is it decreases your seizure threshold. Anyone that is at risk for seizures cannot take this drug. Look out for that in the question system. They'll talk about someone that has depression, but is epileptic. That's, that should be obvious enough, but some less obvious signs, if they have brain tumors, if they're in the state of alcohol or benzo withdrawals, we'll talk about that later, but that can cause and precipitate seizures. And then here's one you should never forget in a commonly a young female that exhibits signs of anorexia or bulimia. When you're forced vomiting, you lose a lot of electrolytes and that can cause you precipitate a seizure. Common way to ask that. All right, so they'll kind of sneak that in there. You might just gloss over, but they say that for a reason and they want you to know not to use this drug. One last thing I want to talk about is not actually a drug. It's called electroconvulsive therapy. And that sounds kind of archaic because it looks kind of archaic. You sedate the patient and you basically shock them. However, it's very, very effective and actually very safe. You can use it in pregnancy. Um, I don't know if you can convince the pregnant woman to undergo it, but you can use it in pregnancy. So safe, effective, basically shock and cause a seizure and you basically stimulate these manually. Yeah, so I'll call it, I'll just say seizure. That doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. And you may start to consider this if you're having a person with depression that's not responding well to drugs so, refractory to drugs. And you might have to think outside the box. Or if they have some sort of acute, acute depression. Yeah, something that really puts them at risk. And as good as these antidepressants are, they take weeks to work. You might need something more acute, and this ECT is acute. That is major depressive disorders. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.